I invite everybody to join in the worship.
So John 16 is not right. The verses are right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Today's scripture reading. Well, I'm just going to read it. (laughs) Jesus, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Thank you. 
Somebody's done already counted. Who was that? You counting a while ago. Said so we got about 15 of our regulars that are not here with us today, and they're scattered here, yonder, and everywhere for various reasons. <clears throat> but we do have a good bunch back with us today, and we're happy that you're part of that number. Um, Brad and Elaine are either in Texas or on their way to Texas. I haven't figured out which one it is yet. So that's two empty spaces up here, but we got a we got a stand in, we got an extra one up here this morning. And uh, all of you uh, saw that Brittany and Josh carried the baby in a few minutes ago, and this is her first time uh, to be at Mount Zion. And, uh, uh, I guess there's first time for all of us. Uh, I remember the first time I was ever here, 79 years ago. Remember it just like it's yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that's what you call a Joe Biden moment there. But anyway, <laughs> uh, my mama told me I was, and uh, I've, I've actually got some witnesses that are here today that can vouch that I was here uh, when I was this baby's age. Uh, and uh, they can vouch that I was here at that time. That my parents told me that Brother J.B. Moss was preaching here in 1941 when I was here. So that's been a long time. I knew Brother Moss in later years uh, at Woodburn when uh, we went to church at Woodburn for about a year. <clears throat> and uh, a fine fellow he was and Mount Zion was fortunate to have him but we're certainly glad that you're here today got a good number uh, and uh, hope that you will get something out of the lesson that we will present today uh, the lesson that we're going to be talking about today is about peace uh, as has already been announced and that scripture reading that we had this morning is taken from John chapter 16. <clears throat> but uh, the, what he read was exactly what it says in, uh, in John 16, 31 through 33. Those three verses tell us that. The key word there is peace. Uh, and that oughtn't be a surprise to us because we're told at the time that of the birth of Christ that uh, and there was a little caption there that we that we still hold dear and near to us today that says peace on earth goodwill to men uh, and we look around us today and we wonder why that that verse isn't taken more seriously than what it is peace on earth because we look around us and we uh, we're skeptical that there's that much peace on earth not only on earth we see the troubles and the tribulations and the trials that are going on all over the place, all over the world, and what people are doing to each other throughout the world. Uh, and we can't very much uh, point an accusing finger here in the United States because we got plenty of it ourselves right here in our own society. Uh, 
I don't think that I've ever seen uh, a time in my life, and again, maybe it's my great memory, <laughs> that any time in my life that people uh, have been at each other's throats and hate each other, worse than they do right now. I can't remember a time in my life when I've seen uh, anything to match it. And we got to wonder, what, what is it? What, what, what causes all this? And so today, we're going to be talking about some of those things, and you'll see that Ryan has put them up on the screen uh, for us this morning. Uh, but it seems like uh, sometimes that the more that we recognize it, the more we try to do about it, even then, the worse it gets. Uh, and we wonder why that is. Uh, uh, we try to come up with some some value, something that we can do about it to make things better, and it doesn't it doesn't get any better. Maybe sometimes, in some cases, it gets worse. Now, think about the fellow that um, he kept getting robbed. <coughs> People would break in his house, and they'd break in his garage and in his tool shed, and they came and they stole his stole his lawnmower, and um, uh, they just kept cleaning him out and he'd go get something else and they'd do it again so he bought him a bulldog he said I'm going to put a stop to this and uh, guess what happened that's right they stole his bulldog uh, and I think that we've got a lot of that in our society today that we try to look for a remedy for it uh, and there, even the remedy gets taken away from us we live in a in a fast-moving, uptight world, tension, stress, <clears throat> and they're identified as uh, by psychiatrists and psychologists as probably the worst enemies that we've got, and they're even worse, they tell us, uh, than physical things that are along with us because poor mental health uh, causes us to have poor physical health and, and so forth. Um, turmoil in our own families some of it's caused by drugs uh, but a lot of it is caused by the way that our society operates today uh, the old adage not just an adage but a law itself uh, under the law of Moses was honor thy father and thy mother uh, as I get older I see less and less of honoring father and mother in this world today Solomon prophesied uh, concerning wickedness in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 6 uh, he says it's going to cause us trouble and he's right and he says again in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 13 that if it's not well with him it, we can't expect a long life and we go to the book of Romans that we're studying in our Sunday school class Romans chapter 7 Paul describes it as a war within. A war within us. Now, we, we think of, of war as, as everything's on the outside, but he says it's on the inside. It's on, uh, a war was within ourselves. I don't need an outside now. I mean, I've got plenty of it right here. That's what Paul says that it is. And so this morning I've entitled this Seven Thieves of Inner Peace. And I don't know of any class of people in the world today that we think less of than we do thieves. Sometimes we say liars. I don't think any of us hold liars in esteem, but people that will steal from you, we have a very low regard for people like that. Thieves of Inner Peace. Um... And what are these? They're not necessarily people, but they're things. And and so what are we discussing this morning about these thieves? What is, what what's taking our peace? How come we don't have peace, inner peace? Uh, and I think that it's a cross-section of life. You don't have to be old. You don't have to be young. <clears throat> uh, but anything that takes our peace away from us, that we can't have peace in this life, what is it that causes us to not have peace in this life. Sometimes we can identify it. Uh, and I think that we do from time to time. Sometimes when we get it identified, we know what we can do in order to keep it from happening again. Sometimes 
we don't accomplish that very well as either. One of the things that I think that is a thief of inner peace is materialism. Uh, you know, a better word for it, I think, is stuff. Stuff. We want plenty of stuff. Uh, we are the stuffiest people that's ever been in this generation. We want plenty. Uh, they've even got a show on television. I don't remember the name of it. You know better than I do. But it's about hoarding. Hoarding. You go into somebody's house and you can't even walk. Uh, sometimes uh, I saw one on there here not too long ago. Uh, it was in this older lady's house. Uh, and she still had everything that she, I think she'd ever bought in her life and her husband too and he would, uh, had passed on <coughs> and, and it was just a path through her living room you couldn't hardly get through you'd have to go this way to, to get through and I thought what do you want with all this stuff uh, we're terrible people do not throw anything away uh, we accumulate and we accumulate it's materialism and what it does, instead of giving us peace, that we have these things, it takes away our peace because we can't keep up with it. <clears throat> um, and it presents a problem when you get older, I can tell you. Uh, I, go, I get out there and go looking through stuff. Something, I look through stuff. Something that I need. And I'm looking for it and I can't find it. And one of the reasons I can't find it because I've got so much other stuff to have to look through. Um, I, I got to wonder sometimes what Adam must think when he comes over there and I've got stuff out there in the gear room of the barn that I ain't touched for 10 years. How bad do I need that if I ain't used it in 10 years? And I've got another little building there, a little shed, and uh, you know what's in it? Stuff. Uh, and, and I can't even give you an inventory of the stuff that's in there. I don't even need it. It ought to be thrown away. It ought to be hauled away. And then what I do need uh, would be easier to find. But we're stuffed people. Materialism. We've got to have plenty of everything. Uh, and we're awful about having stuff. Uh, we're not a kind of people in this world today that are happy with what we have. Whatever it is, we want more. Give me more. Uh, it's that way about money. Who's got enough money? Who's got enough money? I, I, one of the candidates here a couple of weeks ago spent, I don't know if these figures are correct or not, could be a, off by a few billion. What's a billion? But I think they said he spent uh, 500 million million dollars on his campaign and uh, if I heard this right he only got one territory uh, for the candidate for the uh, what do you call that? Delegates. 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 And, and they, they told how much each one of them cost at that rate uh, and I thought you're talking about materialism you're talking about stuff and what money will buy you uh, now he ain't even in the race anymore and that, that made me wonder about that here's one right here debt uh, debt is stuff too the reason we're in debt is because of stuff uh, and debt keeps us from having peace if we owe a lot and we don't see any good way that we're going to get out of debt it causes us inner turmoil and yet even though we've got stuff we want more stuff so we'll go into more debt and that causes us problems. And we as Christians <clears throat> ought to think that over twice about debt, about going into debt. And it's especially true with younger people. Uh, when I was younger, I thought a whole lot less about going into debt than I do now. Uh, I'm really, I, I've got to the point in age in my life that stuff is not as important to me as it once does was. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I'm a little more uh, leery about going into debt than I want to because uh, I need peace uh, and you, you're not going to get peace with debt and the latest fad again older people they don't worry about the latest fad as much as younger people do I think 
Uh, but it causes us a lot of confusion and we don't have very much peace when we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, coveting what somebody else has and I want to be like them and they seem to be accepting. So uh, materialism, that's one of the big ones with that we uh, have in our life that causes us. Uh, I thought of another one that I had Ryan to put up here as well, and that is double-mindedness. Double mind. What is double mindedness? Well, Jesus describes it like this. He says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, he said, You can't serve two masters. You can't do it. You can't serve both God and uh, the old English word for it is mammon. It just simply means material things or money. You can't have both. You can't serve both of them. Because you love one, hate the other, and so forth. You know, you know how that works. Uh, you think you can. You think you can have both, but he says you can't, and the older you get, the more you begin to believe him. John chapter 1, verse 8, we find that a double-minded person is unstable. He says he goes as far as to say unstable in all of his ways. And uh, we were talking about this morning staggering uh, we are talking about staggering when we walked. Uh, well, that's really what this is about right here. It causes us, double-minded, this causes us to stagger because we're torn between two values, two different masters. Uh, Jesus goes on to say this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he says, And then all these material things will be added to you. I think one of the reasons that we don't have peace in our life is is because we put the material things up there and try to have that and to serve that uh, and then also serve and it causes us a lot of problems in this life uh, and and certainly it takes our peace so we don't have peace when we have that. We think we can outdo it but we can't. <clears throat> and then here's one that Certainly it's in our lives today and round about us. And that's childishness. One of the reasons that we don't have inner peace and that has been stolen from us is because we are childish. We need to grow up. Uh, and that is so difficult for a lot of people to do. Not anything wrong with being childish if you are a child. But if you're no longer a child, uh, then you don't need to be childish anymore. Uh, Paul told the Corinthians, he said, you know, you're to the point now that you ought to be on a diet of meat. Uh, but you're not. You're still on milk. Now, how would you think this morning the little child comes into the world like this one that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, and uh, that's what she's supposed to be on is milk. We don't try to give her something beyond that. She's not ready for that yet. Uh, but what if you looked at somebody that um, maybe was approaching adulthood and that's all he did was drink milk. No food, no meat, no vegetables, no nothing but nothing but milk. You'd say, well, something's wrong with that guy. And that's what Peter, uh, Paul was saying here about these Corinthians right here. He said, you know, it's time that you matured. It's time. Uh, we got too many people today that are still acting childish in the church. They act like children do. They're not mature. They're not adults. They're still on milk. And it's time that they were uh, on meat. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, When I was a child, going down memory lane here now like I did a while ago, when I was a child, this is what I did. But now that I'm an adult, now that I'm older, well, what he was saying there is that we as children of God ought not to be childish, that we should have outgrown that by now, especially those of us that have been in the church many years. Another thief of inner peace is pride. Well, now, how could that happen? And I went all the way back to Obadiah chapter 3. And he confided, because he was a prophet of God, he said that pride deceives us. It fools us. Uh, and we were talking in our Sunday school lesson again this morning about 
a man that went up to the temple to pray and uh, he told God all his great virtues. I'm not an uh, adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm a just man. And then he gave him a list of all the things that he didn't do and as well as the good things that he did do. Uh, and you can just see him running over with pride. What we were talking about in the class was uh, boasting or bragging. Uh, uh, we, we see that in our society today, and I mention it quite often even from the pulpit. Uh, but pride brings people down, and it's a cause in our lives for not having peace. If we set a certain standard for ourselves for this pride, uh, and we have difficulty reaching that level or that standard, uh, it doesn't let us have peace. Uh, the Bible tells us that pride goes before destruction. That eventually that pride will destroy us uh, if we don't get a hold of it, if we don't do something about it. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 33, he says pride will bring us low. Pride's not supposed to bring you low, is it? Uh, it's supposed to lift you up. It's supposed to make you happy. And yet it does the very opposite. Uh, and that causes us to have turmoil. It, it causes us problems in our lives and we don't have peace and that is one of the reasons for it. <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons that we don't have peace, uh, one of the thieves of it is prejudice. We're prejudiced. Now, a lot of times when we think of prejudice, we think maybe of it in a, in a gender sense or in a racial sense or uh, in some other way but the prejudice that according to the Bible it's, 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 it's finding fault with everything and everybody and if you do that and you let that reign in your life that nobody ever does anything or says anything to suit me or to make it right you're not going to have peace uh, those two things are at odds but sometimes we run into people that it don't make any difference what you tell them or what you talk to them about there'll be something wrong with it and that always turns us off doesn't it uh, we don't want to be around that person for very long and we'll find a way to uh, to escape from that. that that's what prejudice really is we expect everybody else to see everything just exactly like we see it if you don't see it like I see it we already know who's wrong don't you it's you it's not me I'm I'm in the right. I know that what I think is the right way. <clears throat> and you see sometimes people, have you ever noticed this? People, uh, how do you feel about this? People that are negative on every subject. Doesn't make any difference what, su difference what subject comes up. You can expect that they're going to be negative on that. Uh, does that give you any peace? It doesn't give them any. And I expect that the people, or suspect that the people that think in that way, it doesn't give them any peace either. <clears throat> it's kind of like that Pharisee that we were talking about earlier uh, that went up there to pray, and he simply says that nobody's as good as I am. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I'm perfecter than everybody else is. Uh, and if we feel that way, and that's the way we live our life, we're going to be we're going to come up short on peace. Because nothing is going to ever suit us anyway. Negative people, that's prejudice as well. Never find any peace as long as we find, we find fault with everything and everybody. Nobody ever does it enough uh, to suit us. Uh, we, expect, expect, we expect perfection from other people. Uh, but uh, we can ourselves be excused from we don't have to be but everybody else has to be Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says all have sinned all have some come short of the glory of God uh, if I am guilty myself why can't I see that in other people as well and expect that and maybe I'll have a little bit more peace here's one right here one of the reasons that we don't have peace in our lives and that it's been stolen from us and fear is the thief fear afraid of everything, everybody everything comes down the road we're afraid of it we're afraid that uh, the world's fixing to come to an end because we're digging too much coal 
or because we're producing too much oil or because we've got too many cattle or uh, the ice caps are going to melt and they're going to flood the coastal cities and we're afraid, afraid, fear, fear everywhere you look we've got fear and we don't give God any credit at all as if God uh, is leaving it up to man how long everything's going to last here on this earth and that man's got all the control of it man really doesn't have control over anything God has control over it all but well, that's not our fear our fear is uh, that uh, our fellow man is going to be the cause of this. We're afraid of everything and everybody. Uh, we're afraid that the future uh, is our in our own hands and that God has nothing to do with that. Well, not only are we afraid of the future, we're afraid of the past. It, it causes a lot of problems uh, and there's a lot of people that don't have peace because of their past. How can that be? <clears throat> well, here's how it can be, and it is for a lot of people. They've done something in their past that they're not proud of, and they're afraid that it's going to be found out. It's a fear, and they got they don't have any peace. They don't have any turmoil. I mean, they do have turmoil in their life because of being found out. Uh, and we find that in in high places we see that all the time is it going to be found out uh, and it, they don't have any peace because of it instead of just taking it to God Jesus said just put it on me just lay it all on me whatever it is I'll take care of it we, we, we don't do that because we're afraid to uh, what are we afraid of that Jesus is going to tell it what are we afraid of and yet we don't have peace uh, we don't have peace because unemployment's too high. We don't have peace because we've got a Taliban and an Al Qaeda. We don't have peace because North Korea is liable to blow us up any time, any day, and we don't get a good night's sleep. We don't have peace in our hearts because we're afraid of everything else, and we do not lay our heads on our pillow at night and say, "Lord, Thy will be done." That's the reason we don't have peace. We leave it in man's hands and in our own hands instead of God's hands and we don't have peace. Another and the last one that I'm going to tell you about this morning, I've just made this short list. Seven thieves of inner peace. One of them is doubt. Uh, it's a la uh, doubt is nothing more than a lack of trust and faith. We sing a song uh, here at Mount Zion, the name of it is Faith is the Victory. Uh, and I just wonder how much stock that we put in the words of that song. Do we really believe that song? Or are we still living our lives in doubt? Paul told the Romans in chapter 8 and verse 28, he said, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Does that sound like doubt to you? Does that sound like doubt? Uh, to me, that ought to give every one of us peace. Uh, that we can lay our heads on our pillows at night and say, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I know it's in your hands. I know that as long as I do your will and I'm your child, you're going to take care of me. All things are going to work together for good. And then I remember one last one that I want to share with you this morning. And that is what Jesus said. He said, let not your heart be trouble let not your heart be troubled now he goes on to say a lot more but I thought that ought to be our motto as children of God today don't be troubled have peace in your heart you can have peace and he will give you peace sometimes it just means that we've got to make a few adjustments in our own lives there they are that's my list that I put on the board you could probably put up a list uh uh, of, uh, of seven things and not even touch the ones that I have this morning but that's the ones that I've chosen to share with you this morning I hope that you got something out of the lesson this morning if you're here this morning and you don't have peace in your heart and one reason you don't have peace is you don't know whether you're going to be saved or not that's the worst feeling that there is in the world that's the worst feeling to not have the peace to know that God's going to save your soul when this life is over do you know whether he's going to save you or not? 
The Bible tells you what you need to do in order to be saved. If you've done that, you can have the peace that passes all understanding. You can know that God is going to save you. God's going to keep His Word if you're obeying Him. It doesn't give you any peace to know that if you haven't done this, that you're going to be lost. There's no peace in that. If you haven't done what God has told you that you need to do, you're not going to have peace in your heart. You're not going to live a life of peace. Are you here this morning? Is there something that we can do for you here at Mount Zion this morning? While we stand and while we sing. <laughs> strangers here at Mount Zion most of us here at Mount Zion have known them since they were babies about like that one right there and really uh, Mount Zion's home to them uh, and has been really uh, all the way along uh, but they're approaching maturity now uh, 
and I've been sort of feeling that this is coming on for a few weeks now. Uh, we're proud of the whole family, the whole Lyons family to say the least. Uh, the problem is that as it stands as of this minute, neither one of them has ever been baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, I thought that that's what this was about and what they wanted, but I asked anyway. Uh, and they said, we want to be saved. And they do. And the way that you do that is to follow what the Bible tells you to do uh, in God's plan of salvation. And the very first thing that you have to do is to believe. So uh, they know that, because I've done already discussed this with them, they, they know that both of them, they, they need to recognize that Jesus is God's Son. So we're going to ask them both to stand up. Uh, and we're going to ask them one at a time. Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son? Bless you for that. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son? Yes, I do. And they do. And we admire both of them for having done that. Love them to death. Just like our own kids and grandkids. And so at this point, what we're going to do is ask some of the ladies for help to get them dressed for baptism and uh, we'll get ready to do that at right this minute. Y'all can go, I guess, over here on this side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need to go. Debbie's coming. Debbie. Couldn't think of their names to save my life. Lindsay and Haley. Lindsay and Haley. Okay, okay. Lindsay and Haley. That's another one of my moments. I, I'm not as good with names as I know them all my life, but I was apologizing to Brian and Michael last week for getting their names mixed up, and now here Lindsay and Haley. And, uh, but Mackenzie and Michaela, I, I don't have any problem with that for some reason or other, but I do with, I do with these two. So that's who it's going to be, and we're going to get ready. And I'm going to ask Barry, as I always have, uh, to help me. <laughs> Yeah. 
right next to it. It was like 298. It's like the uh, parking lot after 298. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And in the light from heaven filled my soul. because you have publicly said in front of this church that you believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son, you are now being baptized for the remission of sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
you know, one of the things that we do in our year at Mount Sun that I, I think is a real good practice is every time that we have a bad time, a wine or most kind of thing, uh, unless you do a bad time, I take a picture of uh, it. And I think somebody over there, every time we do that, I think we put a picture in the photo. Uh, and boy, is that good advertising for the church. Because everywhere that boat can go, and believe you me, it goes out there. Uh, people see that, and they know it. And uh, that's a good practice. I hope that we all can keep that up. And uh, I don't know if anything that we can do here at Mount that would be better for the church than what we're doing. on Wednesday night we talked about ways that we serve God in our lives and when it came to me I couldn't help but to think that my answer would be generic and fairly short instead I realized more so the ways I serve myself and the world before God I thought about the things that never really leave my mind for me currently it's several different things that's going on in life learning a new job uh, studying for a new license, finishing remodeling a house, and I got a whole list of other things that uh, I serve myself and that are all about me. It's sad to realize how far down the list I'd have to go to find God. But I also found out that I'm not alone. We all have our list within our minds, and for, the most, and for most of us, that list is fairly long. And as days pass, we keep adding and adding to this list, pushing God further down. Then there's Jesus. He served his father by seeking and saving the lost. That if one out of a hundred falls away, you break your back and do everything you can to return them. His words and actions pointed towards his heavenly father. He served as a guide, the only avenue to get to his father. He carried a love so great that he chose to die brutally on a cross. He chose us, the son of God, 
Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He didn't have a list. The one thing I was looking for while thinking about everything in my life was the only thing that he cared about. So let's clear our minds of all of our lists and remember our Savior as we go to prayer over the loaf. And we'll ask Jerry to lead that prayer. Father, we are grateful once again for the Lord God of this table of remembrance, the sinner's end, the sacrifice you made for us that we might have been salvation. Yes, Father, you bless this loaf that is for us as Christians and my Lord, our Lord and Savior, and the sacrifice of the Son for us. And we will never be dead and honor that day from the way we can take it. In this name, God, amen. Have you ever been chosen for anything? Maybe chosen for an important task or appointed to lead a group, asked to be in a wedding, uh, maybe even been picked to be on a team. Something of that sort. Uh, I'm sure we've all had moments of being chosen. Do you remember how special that it made you feel, knowing that, uh, knowing that out of all the other options, it was you that was wanted? That feeling of belonging and not being left out is an amazing feeling. And there's a scripture that makes me feel this way whenever I come across it. It comes from the 15th chapter of John. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus is speaking. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Jesus chose us. He chose us over the defeat of sin, and he chose us even before himself. So let's feel that love of being chosen as we partake of the cup, and we'll ask Ryan to lead our prayer. Ryan, Eric. 
all that you are to us. We thank you for your son. We're grateful that he is our Prince of Peace. And Father, we are grateful that you've chosen us and that your salvation extends to everybody on the earth who, who wants and desires it. Father, help us to clear our minds and pray that we will focus on Jesus in this moment and focus on his death on the cross and pray that this cup represents that blood that was shed for us. Pray to help us not just to remember Jesus now, but when we leave this building and every day of the week. In Christ's name we pray. We should put thought into what we're about to do. And after we give today, we shouldn't stop thinking about it. Throughout the entire week, we should put thought into it until we return to give again. Every transaction transaction we make elsewhere, train ourselves to think and compare it to what we do here each first day of the week and not make it a mindless routine, but instead a willing sacrifice. Again, if you'll bow, we'll ask Brian to lead our prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the richness of your blessings that you every day shower us with blessings and you, you care for us, you care for our families, you give us the means that we might uh, obtain uh, money that we can use to, to live our lives and to feed our families and to care for ourselves and to care for us. Father, we pray that the, we give back a portion of that today that we've set aside to you that we might give the church so that the church can have money to operate. 
church and have money to, to give to those in need. And the Father will pray blessings upon those who, who care for the, the, the money and to make sure it's spent wisely. The Father will pray for the elders and the deacons of the congregation that they can make good decisions along these lines. Father, thank you for the church worldwide, most especially for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Yeah. 
Father, now that we was able to come and gather in your name and sing songs of praise to you. Hear a word, Father, to us. We pray, Father, that we find peace in you and look to you for your strength and guidance in everything we do. We thank you, Father, for Lindsay and Haley and their decision they made this morning to become part of the church and follow you. We pray, Father, that we are the examples for them that they will need to lead their Christian lives. We pray, Father, that we are the shining lights throughout the community, that we go out into the community and look for those who are lost. We pray, Father, that we do everything that we can to bring lost souls to you. We pray, Father, for those who are sick to shut in. We pray that you continue to look after them, give them the strength and guidance to know that you can. Uh, also, Father, we pray that you do with the doctors, the nurses, the caretakers, all the people who look after the sick and shut in, we pray that you give them the peace and guidance that they need. We pray, Father, that they also look to you for your strength and guidance. Father, we, as we go out our separate ways, we continue to look to you. We pray, Father, that we always keep you in our hearts and in our minds. What we do is in your name, where we fall short, we just ask for that forgiveness. In Jesus Christ's name, Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.